This is a new day. This is a new day full of sound, light, and expectation, and snow. This day has been waiting for you. This day has been waiting especially for you, to embrace you, to guide you. This day has been waiting with open arms just for you. This is the day we have been given. Let's not waste it. Come now and let us worship together. Good morning. I would like to extend a special welcome to those who are visiting us for the first, second, or maybe even third time, and also to those who are in person again for the first time today. It is so, so good to be here with you all. I would like at this time to welcome Lisbeth White to the lectern for a brief announcement. Here she comes as our board president, Lisbeth White. I have a million more announcements after this, but we want to start with this one. Good morning, everyone. Sorry about that. I was also greeting. Um, I just wanted to give you an update. Starting a couple weeks ago, we initiated a special fundraising opportunity to collect um, funds to put together and send to help it in Ukraine. And we, um, that was initiated by member Sarah Lowry, who reached out, did some research, and found uh, an organization called United Help Ukraine, which seemed like the best option available. And so we actually received feedback from them this week. Um, Sarah, thank you for your support and reaching out. We are overwhelmed with emails and therefore apologize for the delayed response. The best you can do is to help spread the word and ask for donations. We are actively working to purchase and deliver supplies. Please see our most recent delivery report here. And they sent, they have all these updates. I mean, they're sending like 5,000 backpack first aid packets, you know, in a week and 700 pairs of boots and like all kinds of amazing stuff is going. Um, so I'm going to, I have my iPad, I brought my iPad, and so at coffee hour, just come and take a look. Um, the other thing is that, what well, we're, I, I would say, continue to support this if you can and want to just indicate it when you do your donation that it's for the Ukraine fund, and we'll just continue to, to do that. Um, the, the greater Youngstown um, Jewish Federation has pulled together $35,000 for this effort, and they continue 
to, to work to raise funds. And so there's ample opportunity and thank you. Thank you, Lisbeth. One more quick one. Oh, yes. So if you look at the front and the back of the sanctuary, you will see the first of our sort of sanctuary um, accessibility improvements where we ha now have more space for access for people with mobility challenges front and back. So it actually happened. <laughs> Great work, everyone. All right, and so continuing on with announcements, I do have two announcements for next Sunday. Um, the first, next Sunday at 6 p.m. at St. Marin Church, Antioch Hall on Meridian Road in Youngstown, uh, the United Nations Association um, of the United States of America, the Youngstown chapter, will sponsor a panel discussion of the conflict in a forum that's free and open to the public. It will be held in the Antioch Hall of St. Marin Maronite Catholic Parish in Youngstown, which is co-sponsoring this public event. The Society of St. John Chrysostom, Youngstown Warren Chapter, the Mahoning Valley International Civic and Cultural Society, the Arab American Community Center of Greater Youngstown, and the Coalition for Peace in the Middle East are also co-sponsoring this program. And there is a link online in our online order of service if you want more information regarding that event next Sunday evening at 6 p.m. Also next Sunday, April 3rd, is UUYO's official, or unofficial, Bring a Friend to Church Day. So I encourage everyone, whether you show up in person or you're still on Zoom, to maybe send a link, and let's all commit to bringing one friend next Sunday. I think we can all do that. Meditation. Uh, consider joining experienced meditation teacher Linda Scharf on our Zoom channel Wednesdays at 11 a.m. and Sundays at 7 p.m for an hour-long session on mindfulness and meditation. Linda has um, at least two decades of experience with Tibetan Buddhism, and she is currently um, undergoing training to become certified. She has transformed my life with these meditation se uh, sessions. Again, those are currently on Zoom. And you can link to the Zoom channel um, at uuyo.org. Um, also, on April 30th, it's a Saturday, Reverend Joseph, along with Zen Buddhist teacher from New York City, Reverend Daikin, will lead an in-person half-day meditation retreat in person here at UUYO. So the time and details are forthcoming. And finally, as many of you know, we voted to adopt the eighth UU principle in December 2020, which states, journeying towards spiritual wholeness by working to build a diverse, multicultural beloved community by our actions that accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and our institutions. So please join us following service today around 1215 in Schweitzer Lounge. You have time to get coffee and all that. For an eighth principle meeting, uh, we'll share in discussion of how we might actively engage with this principle in our community. And for those of you on Zoom who are wishing to attend, just stay on the Zoom channel and you'll be with us. All right, I would very much like to extend a very warm welcome to our guest speakers, Ashley and Sean, who have joined us to share their story today. Um, I just would like to share a little bit about their bios. Ashley Stevens, she, her, is a 31-year-old cisgender woman from Newcastle, Pennsylvania. She is a licensed professional counselor and nationally certified counselor and has practiced as a mental health therapist since 2015. She currently works at a behavioral health inpatient hospital in Morgantown, West Virginia, where she resides with her spouse of three years, Sean. Ashley loves her cat, Bernie, mountaineer sports, working out with her spouse and friends at Orange Theory Fitness, watching movies and listening to music. She has been through many, many life experiences that have shaped her into who she is today. But her spouse, coming out as a trans woman before their first wedding anniversary, is the biggest one. She is so proud of who she is and who her spouse is, and she's excited to share their story with you. Sean Brown, she, they, is a bisexual trans woman from New Wilmington, Pennsylvania. Sean is a chemical engineer, and doctoral student who works on catalysis and material science. Sean worked in manufacturing and the energy industry for four years 
prior to starting their PhD at West Virginia University in 2018. <clears throat> Since around their early teens, Sean knew something was different and identified in secret with the label trans. Sean and Ashley met in 2011, right after Sean's last major gender crisis. They dated for seven years until a traditional marriage in the Catholic Church. The feelings of guilt about Sean's identity grew until it was no longer possible to maintain a lie. And Sean came out to Ashley at dinner in August, <clears throat> not so coincidentally, after visiting New York City's World Pride 2019 event and Ginger's, a famous lesbian bar in Brooklyn. Sean enjoys science, hiking, gardening, photography, and making music with guitars and synthesizers. I'll direct your attention to uh, Zoom for the chalice lighting with Jan Grigsby. Good morning. My name is Jan Grigsby and I work with LGBTQ plus programming here at UUIO. Uh, as they said, today's service is about the, the uh, Transgender Day of Visibility. This is an international holiday that was established in 2009. And it was established by an activist named Rachel Crandall. She was a little discouraged that the only transgender focused day was the Transgender Day of Remembrance, a day we mourn the murders of transgender individuals. And that's a day we acknowledge here at UUYO. But she wanted a day that celebrated transgender people, that uh, raised awareness about discrimination and highlighted accomplishments of people from the transgender community. So I poked around the web a little bit and looked at ways that all of us could acknowledge this day. We can write to our political representatives and ask them how they plan to include transgender individuals in a positive way in their legislation. We can um, write to companies that have trans inclusive employment policies and the human rights campaign uh, website has a list of those organizations. And I have to say, I was pleasantly surprised with how long the list is, everything from Adidas to uh, Sephora. We can have conversations with our friends and family about transgender issues. We can uh, ask our school or work or places we hang out, restaurants, to have an all gender bathroom if they don't already. And we can respectfully use the pronouns, they, them, et cetera, that individuals have indicated that they prefer. So with acknowledgement of the many accomplishments of our transgender brothers and sisters, we light this chalice. When Aiden Became a Brother by Kyle Lukoff, illustrated by Kalani Juanita. When Aiden was born, everyone thought he was a girl. His parents gave him a pretty name. His room looked like a girl's room, and he wore clothes that other girls liked wearing. But as Aiden got bigger, he hated the sound of his name. He felt like his room belonged to someone else. And he always ripped or stained his clothes, accidentally, on purpose. Everyone thought he was just a different kind of girl. Some girls had rooms full of science experiments and bug collections. Lots of girls didn't wear dresses. But Aiden didn't feel like any kind of girl. He was really another kind of boy. It was hard to tell his parents what he knew about himself, but it was even harder not to. It took everyone some time to adjust and they learned a lot from other families with transgender kids like him. 
Aiden explored different ways of being a boy. He tried out lots of names until one stuck. They changed his bedroom into a place where he belonged. He also took much better care of his new clothes. Then one day, mom and dad had something to tell him. I'm going to have a baby, mom announced. A baby, Aiden said. Does that mean I get to be a big brother? Of course, said dad, ruffling his hair. Aiden thought that being a big brother was an important job for a boy like him. He wanted to make sure this baby would feel understood right away. The baby needed clothes, so Aiden and his mom went shopping. There were so many choices. Would the baby like seahorses or penguins better? Are you having a boy or girl? asked the lady. Aiden didn't like it when people asked if he was a boy or a girl, and he hoped the baby couldn't hear yet. He was glad when mom just smiled and said, I'm having a baby. The baby's room needed to be painted, so Aiden and his dad went to the hardware store. Dad chose a gallon of sky blue paint and Aiden added a puffy cloud white. Are you excited for your new brother or sister? asked the paint guy. I'm excited to be a big brother, Aiden said. The paint guy looked confused. Aiden could tell that he wanted to ask a different question and was glad to have his dad there. The big rollers were fun to paint with. This room feels just like being outside, Aiden exclaimed. He had always felt trapped in his bedroom before they fixed it, but his new sibling wouldn't have to feel that way. You're right, said dad. Let's make some special shapes in the clouds. Every baby needs a name. Aiden loved getting to choose his own, but he remembered that it had been hard for his parents to let go of the name they gave him. He looked for names that could fit this new person, no matter who they grew up to be. Babies need someone to read to them, so Aiden practiced and practiced and practiced. Dad wanted to teach Aiden how to change diapers. Um, maybe later, said Aiden. He decided that picking flowers for his mom was more important. Two weeks before the baby's due date, Aiden started to worry. Maybe he should have picked different clothes. The blue walls might be too bright. He wished he could ask the baby which name they liked best. Mom came to tuck him in. Are you feeling okay, sweetie? She asked. Aiden put his hands over where he thought the baby's ears would be. Do you think the baby will be happy with everything? He whispered. I don't want them to feel like I did when I was little, but what if I get everything wrong? What if I don't know how to be a good big brother? Mom hugged him tight. When you were born, we didn't know you were going to be our son. We made some mistakes, but you helped us fix them. And you taught us how important it is to love someone for exactly who they are. This baby is so lucky to have you, and so are we. The next day, Aiden found the boxes of his old baby pictures. He looked so different back then. It hadn't been easy, but he liked the boy he was growing into. Maybe everything wouldn't be perfect for this baby. Maybe he would have to fix mistakes he didn't even know he was making. And maybe that was okay. Aiden knew how to love someone, and that was the most important part of being a brother. The time of any children, 
wish to join Kathleen Hogue for religious exploration. Please join me in reading the covenant from your order of service. Love is the spirit of this church and service its law. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. Each month, we donate all loose cash and unmarked checks put in the offering plate to a nonprofit organization whose mission and actions are consistent with the UU principles and the mission of UUYO. For those in the sanctuary, there are silver plates near the exits where you can place your offering as you leave service. UUYO's Give Away the Plate recipient for March 2022 is the Fund for Women and Girls at the Community Foundation of the Mahoning Valley. The Fund for Women and Girls seeks to expand women's philanthropy while empowering and celebrating current and future women leaders in the Mahoning Valley. Permanently endowed, the fund pulls and grows gifts from both women and men, whom we call shareholders, and then reinvests those gifts in the community through thoughtful and directed grant making. The grants serve as an investment in nonprofit programs that are having a positive impact on the lives of traditionally underserved women and girls in our community. Through partnerships with these and other organizations, the fund works to be a catalyst for change by bringing awareness to the challenges facing women and girls and then investing in their solutions, the fund hopes to ensure an enduring and vibrant community for everyone. The Fund for Women and Girls has held several community events recognizing and supporting the leadership and contributions of women and girls in the Mahoning Valley. These include Gems of the Valley, an annual fundraising event celebrating women who are making an impact to improve the quality of life and opportunity for women and girls, and a micro-funding event which focuses on identifying and supporting new or smaller nonprofit organizations or initiatives whose missions center on removing barriers for women and girls to succeed. Your generous contributions will allow the Fund for Women and Girls to continue cultivating partnerships and resources to make the Mahoning Valley a more just, equitable, and prosperous community. We will now receive the offering that supports the life of Youngstown, the Mahoning Valley, and our wider world.
Please join me now in a few brief moments of silent meditation. There Should Be Flowers by Joshua Jennifer Espinoza. There should be more to life than disruption and survival, but there isn't. There should be birds singing your name. There should be paintings the size of skyscrapers memorializing your body. There should be love for you and everything. There should be a billion women jumping at the same time to move the earth off its course. There should be parties to celebrate the end of this world there should be flowers to welcome a new one. You are so beautiful. Take one. Oh. 
Hello, like Lindsay said, I'm Ashley. Um, I am 31 years old. I was born and raised in Newcastle, Pennsylvania. And um, I went to college at St. Vincent College, which is in Latrobe, PA, if anyone is familiar with that. It's a very tiny Catholic school. Um, I was a psych major. I began to become interested in counseling, which like Lindsay said, I am a licensed professional counselor. I've been a counselor since 2015. Um, in college, I was afforded the experience of getting to know people that were a lot different than me. Growing up in Newcastle, uh, there's a lot of the same background, a lot of the same cultural experiences. So in college, I began to see di different people, sexual orientations, different racial backgrounds. Um, so I kind of began challenging some of the internal biases that I had. Um, in grad school, I really started to do that um, because I was, again, going to school to be a counselor. So that was a huge piece of the schooling, the cultural competencies and making sure that you kind of were aware of who you were, where you came from and what different things you carried and how to kind of better yourself from that. Um, so that's a little bit about me. In terms of Sean and I, we began dating in 2011, like Lindsay had mentioned. We grew up in the same area, knew each other kind of on and off, didn't go to school together, but knew each other throughout school because we did go to the same Catholic church growing up. So we were in Sunday school together on and off. Um, most of our relationship was spent long distance. We dated when I was in school and Sean was in school at WVU and kind of just remained long distance. Um, in 2013, Sean's dad, Bill, was diagnosed with brain cancer. So that was the first major thing that we went through together as a couple. In 2014, he passed away. Um, we stayed dating, continued to date in, I guess 2015 is when I got my first job. Sean was working in Pittsburgh. We continued to remain long distance. In 2017, we got engaged and Sean um, decided to come back to school. So moved back to where I was in Morgantown the whole time. So moved back here where we currently reside in Morgantown. And we got married in 2018. Um, throughout this whole time, I had no idea that Sean was a trans woman. We obviously never talked about it, um, but we also, like, I had no inkling. People have asked me that before if I ever knew signs or anything, and I had no, I truly had no idea. Um, like Lindsay mentioned, in 2019, we went to World Pride, which was um, in New York City, and for those who don't know, it's a giant pride event that is somewhere in the world every year. It was in New York City in 2019. So we got to like go to all the parades and do all of the different things. Um, coming home from Pride, I always like have been very vocal as an ally to the LGBTQ community. Um, I never thought that I had like anything more to work through. I thought that through college, through grad school, being a therapist to various backgrounds, like that I was good in terms of my allyship. And so coming home from Pride, I felt pretty confident that I was, you know, a great ally. Um, 
in August, like Lindsay mentioned, um, <laughs> we were going to dinner with two of our good friends and we just got on the subject of kind of like talking, I think about pride or about trans people in, gen in like general. And Sean just said like, I have a secret, but I always imagined that I would take it to my grave. I never wanted to tell anyone. And so of course, me I'm like you have to tell me like what are you talking about John's like no no like I can't tell you so we kind of had a conversation back and forth and then finally I I guessed sort of like are you trans or do you like wear women's clothing or what is it and Sean just um acknowledged wearing women's clothing but wasn't comfortable with identifying as a trans woman yet so we I learned about that. We went to dinner with our friends and then we continue to kind of talk about it. Um, fast forward to like January, February, March of 2020, COVID hit. So we have been like dealing with it together, but not many people knew because it was such a private journey. And then COVID began. So we were really alone and just together in our house. I work in a hospital, so I was in person. So I have been in person this whole time. Um, Sean goes to school, so was also in person slash virtual. So we were worried about COVID, dealing with this humongous thing in our relationship, in our marriage, and we were not even to our first wedding anniversary. And so I know for myself, I struggled a lot with being supportive while also trying to take care of myself because we were both struggling in different ways with how it was impacting us. Um, I think that for myself, there was a lot of fear and worry that we weren't going to stay together and that I didn't know what that would look like or how we would tell anyone or just a lot of like the what ifs, the catastrophizing, which is what I like to do when I'm really anxious about things. Um, so we ended up getting a couples counselor. Her name was Kayla. She was awesome. She specialized in gender um, therapy and like worked with a lot of trans people, a lot of couples who a spouse came out as trans or a partner came out as trans. So she was super, super helpful. Through that process, I realized that the ally I thought I was, I wasn't. I had a lot of internalized homophobia still and what it would mean for me to be with a woman. I had a lot of internalized transphobia that I never realized because I never obviously had, I, I had never been in the situation where I was with a trans person. Um, so I had a lot of stuff to kind of figure out and challenge with myself, which I worked on simultaneously while Sean was working on things for themselves. Um, it was a really challenging time. It was definitely the hardest thing that I have ever done. Uh, I actually, when I was getting ready to give this talk, I was writing down a, in our little journals that we have, I have a little journal that I found downstairs, and I found an entry from 2021 in February, and um, it was right after we had taken our first like trip with COVID, kind of still here, but I was vaccinated. Um, and the last line of the journal, to give backstory, the journal entry was just kind of about how Sean was becoming more confident as they transitioned. I was getting less confident that we would remain together because I didn't know how it would work. And the last line of the journal says, I hope that one day I will look back on this and see my words were wrong, but only time will tell. Which I think is pretty fitting since I didn't even remember writing that and I saw it yesterday when I was kind of drawing down how I wanted to give this talk. Um, I guess in terms of just sharing this with you guys, whenever Sean first came out, I had no support in terms of like just stories. No, anything I looked up, there was nothing where partners stayed with their partner or spouse when they came out. There was no stories of people like working through it or just finding a way to remain together. Sean and I had been together about 10 years before Sean came out. So we had a very long history. We've experienced a lot of life together. We grew through a lot of life together. And so that was a huge thing for me whenever Sean first came out, just the 
the fact that there was nothing, no no partner stories at all other than you're going to get divorced or you're going to leave your partner because it doesn't work. And so um, I guess for myself, I was pretty committed to trying to make our relationship work, but also for us to be true to one, one another and ourselves. If it wasn't working because I didn't want to be with a woman, then we had to be honest about that. If it wasn't working because Sean didn't want to be with me after coming out, like we had to be honest about that. So that was a huge piece of our, our time too, was just kind of being honest all the time, which sucked a lot of the time. But um, yeah, it just has been a really life-changing experience. We have been, Sean's been out now for about three years to me. Um, we started coming out slowly to like some of our super close friends kind of right after Sean came out to me just so that I had some support Sean had some support but n not a lot of people knew um our other close friends we came out to kind of a maybe like a year and a half two years into it after we kind of worked through our own stuff and we were fairly confident that we were going to stay together um I made a Facebook public kind of post in October of 2021 where we got a lot of support just from other people in our lives and just have continued to grow. Um, there's a lot of things that go into transition. Not everyone who is trans medically transitions or socially transitions. Um, that was conversations that we had a lot was just how that would look for our lives if we wanted to have family, if we wanted to like how we would go about if we move somewhere. And so just like a lot of the honest conversations and um, now going through HRT with not, obviously I'm not doing that, but being the support for Sean, it's just very, very wild to me that three years ago, if you would have told me I would be married to a trans woman, I would have said absolutely no way. Um, and so I'm just very glad that for myself, I had the journey of, figuring out what I needed and who I was and what was holding me back. And we were able to stay together. I attest that a lot to the foundation that we built. We're each other's best friends. We've, like I said, been together for a very long time. Um, there's a lot of love in our relationship. And so it's just been a very, very important and journey that I'm a, a very glad to be a part of and that's all for me so you're up okay um my name is Sean I'm 31 years old and I'm a trans woman and I'm married to Ashley I grew up in New Wilmington Pennsylvania and I was born in 1991 the world was very different in 1991 than it is today trans people were not visible and those that were visible were either a joke or fetishized and that story's been told a lot so i'm not going to go into that but if you want to learn about that there's a documentary on netflix called the disclosure that i recommend that you watch and it will discuss that much better than i could um so one of my identities is a trans woman the other is that i'm a scientist and an engineer and the way that i think those all connect with my relationship is that i didn't see like ashley said i didn't see a way that i could be all of those things together i thought i would have to choose um and i knew fairly young that i didn't identify as male. I enjoyed traditional things that women enjoy and I spent a lot of time um, friends with women growing up. Um, I don't know when I first learned about trans women but it was pretty early and I knew it was technically possible <laughs> to be a trans woman but I had no idea how to do that and I had no support because Again, the world was very different, and I grew up in rural Pennsylvania. Um, so that was hard for me growing up. And there were a lot of things for me growing up that 
I struggled with that I think became more clear after I came out as to why it was a challenge. Um, I felt pretty de detached from my life in a lot of ways. And I coped with that in different ways, um, mostly by working <laughs> and um, school. And I guess I had sort of a feeling that I didn't have much of a direction. And like the introduction mentioned, in around 2011, I had a lot of changes going on. It was like my first time away from home. I had already tried to come out as trans once and it failed. Um, and it was just really hard. Um, but I just decided that I would focus on working and I would <laughs> basically like exclude this part of my life from the future. Um, so I met Ashley like a year later, we started dating, everything was going really well, I felt like my life was together, and a few years later, um, my dad was diagnosed with uh, brain cancer, and he pretty rapidly died. Um, we both graduated, Ashley started grad school, I found a job, and I moved away, and then we became long distance. Um, so you can see there's like a trend, there's a thread of uh, like disorder that follows the story. And that really allowed me to not deal with this. So three years later, I was still working. We were still kind of long distance, but I began to feel dis disappointed with what my life was. Um, I was living in a basement in Pittsburgh. I was working in a cubicle. It just felt like this can't be all there is. Um, and so, the first thing that I really did for myself was I decided I had always wanted to go to graduate school and applying to that graduate program here allowed me to move back to Ashley. So we, we had been apart for like four years long distance and it was really hard. Um, so I did that, we moved back, we were engaged to be married. We got married in a humongous wedding in the Catholic church. It was really nice. And I will say that like, the story, the sort of traditional story of like a trans person before they come out and a trans person after they come out, I was not completely miserable. There was a part of my life that was hidden and it felt incomplete and I felt like I lacked direction, but I wasn't completely unhappy. I really enjoyed everything that happened. And like Ashley said, we were best friends and we supported each other through all of these changes. Um, so my first year of grad school was obviously very busy. Ashley started a new job at the hospital. Um, so we finally started to settle down and like six months into it, these feelings came back. And I really felt dishonest because now I was in like a committed serious relationship. And I felt like there's this whole part of my life that I haven't told anyone about. Um, so basically, like Ashley said, we, we went to World Pride with some friends. Um, when we came back, I basically came out. <laughs> I identified as non-binary for a while um, because I was also, like Ashley said, like, even people in the trans community carry their own transphobia and homophobia. And I just didn't feel comfortable identifying as a woman, even though I think it's like, it was pretty obvious that I was a trans woman and there's space within womanhood for people like me. Um, so it just took a lot of time and it was really difficult because it was something that we were both going through and navigating independently. And we really couldn't relate much to each other I was in West Virginia. It's not known for its LGBTQ community. So I had to find support online and I had to like form my own identity from scratch. It was really hard to have the self-confidence I needed while we were trying to navigate our marriage. And I would say that without us being as close as we were, without, um, a competent therapist and without 
taking space and time that we needed, we would have probably failed as a couple. And there are many times that I thought we would fail. Um, obviously we didn't, but it took time. It took years, I would say. Mm -hmm. I've been out now at least socially transitioning, which is separate from medically transitioning for like three years. And I started medically transitioning, I would say this summer. Mm -hmm. um, and it just took time to work up to that. I mean, at this point, I'm out to my friends, my family, and my colleagues, and everyone has been really supportive. And I would say that's like the most important part is that there was a supportive community for me. And right now, the, the world seems very scary for trans people, especially in the United States, and we really need that community. Um, so that's, I think, all I wanted to say. I think I'm running out of time. Thanks for listening. I really appreciate it. I want to express immense gratitude for Ashley and Sean for being with us here today um, and sharing um, just such a powerful testament of love. Thank you, Ashley and Sean. Please pr pray with me. Spirit of life, today and every day, remind us of the steadfast love that connects us all in this interdependent web of life. On Transgender Visibility Day and every day, may you protect trans folks against the storms of injustice and ignorance, and let love be a reminder that all bodies are divine. All this we pray. Amen. And rise as you are willing and able, um, and join us and singing, yes, we are singing in church for the second Sunday in a row, hymn number 1014 in the Till Hymnal, Standing on the Side of Love. We extinguish this flame 
but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we hold in our hearts to share with all of the world. Please remember the one great fact. You are loved and never truly alone. Thank you. 